Let's welcome in our first guest, Summer Barrett, joins us via telephone. Good morning, Summer. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Ruckus this morning, as always. Uh, I can't control the Admiral. Yeah. You uh, you sound like you have a cold or something, do you, Summer? You know what? No. I I just have had a stuffy nose for months. I think it, maybe it's part of pregnancy. I'm not sure. Oh, <laughs> It pre- just never seems to go away. You're pregnant again? <laughs> I am, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Congratulations. <laughs> Rob, you are one of the world's great detectives. You know, after someone she said tells part, maybe pregnant. part of pregnancy and you say, oh, are you pregnant? Because if she had said no, now that would have been a more interesting conversation. Well, it, it might have been left over from the first pregnancy, too. <laughs> okay. A lot of stuff happens with women that we don't know about and don't want to know about, that by the way. That would have been very long lingering symptoms. <laughs> it, it would have been, <laughs> but it happens. Almost two. It does happen, though. Yeah. I mean, things happen. Well, congratulations again. Thank you. We're having a little girl. She's due late May, but I say that with a, you know, quote unquote, because Berkeley was also due in May. And yeah. Oh, that's she true. She came very, very early. So. Yeah. Do you have a name yet? I'm, I'm sure you do, like you did yeah. last time. You wouldn't tell us, though. Are you going to tell us this it's time? Ex- no, I'm not allowed. Jason has a very strict <laughs> no telling our children's name policy. Are you are you staying on the uh, county method of uh, giving names, or are you breaking that? Uh, it it is not a county. It's name. not a county. I will, okay. say, I will I will say that. <laughs> Although Jefferson is a pretty strong, well, I going, uh, I strong thought, name. I thought Canal County would be a nice. Canal is a good name. Mingo. <laughs> Mingo. 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 Yeah. Hey, like we'll, that we'll come up with a lot of good names when we county summer. Just stay with us a minute. <laughs> I would, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you haven't ruled out Mingo yet, I would strongly <laughs> consider Mingo. That's a, who played Mingo? <laughs> oh, uh, that's a great question. Who was it? Um, uh, Daniel Boone. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, the big guy. Uh, the, oh, yes. Yeah. It'll, It'll come to me. Somebody in our Facebook. Oh, yeah, right. it was actually the guy that played for the Detroit Lions. Uh, the uh, Alex Harris. Alex Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, 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 that's Mongo that's from Mongo Blazing Saddles. From, yes. Yeah, that's Mongo from Blazing Saddles. You got and the there's a difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, I, yeah, Mingo is not exactly a great little girl's name. But no, but I, I sympathize <laughs> I do with... Appreciate, I do appreciate the input, though. Ed Ames. Ed Ames, thank you. Yeah, he, he's the guy that had the famous Johnny Carson best of yep. uh, with the axe throwing where he hit the shock figure in the groin. It's, it's one way of putting it. Aren't you glad you called in? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you guys have made my morning yes uh, well anyway going forward with uh, your, your expanding family with you and Jason and Berkeley and Mingo uh, it's going to be a wonderful <laughs> thing going forward to get that Christmas picture uh, let's talk yeah. about what the uh, Republican Party has voted to do summer on Saturday a vote took place as to whether or not we would allow those outside the party to vote in primaries going forward what happened Saturday <clears throat> well um, it was, as I'm sure you can imagine, it was very, very entertaining, almost like this morning's show so far. <laughs> almost. Um, <laughs> it, uh, so I, I'm going to try to explain what happened. I'm also on the resolutions committee, which is where these resolutions come prior to the full state executive committee. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we went through <clears throat> all of the resolutions that were being proposed at this meeting. And um, this closing the primaries was one of them, despite I, I'm, I was a little frustrated by it because we had the almost the same exact resolution last summer heading into our meeting and we the committee voted against it. Um, so it was by, a fairly large, by fairly large number two, if memory serves. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Both the resolutions committee <clears throat> and then it was brought up on the floor. And they also voted it down. So I was a little frustrated that in the same uh, cycle of the executive committee, we were dealing with the same issue again. But regardless, um, on the committee, I attempted to amend it to 2026, and I that uh, failed. That amendment failed in committee. Um, however, the three of us that voted to change it to 2026 submitted that uh, amendment to the full committee um and that amendment did actually by a very narrow vote i think it was by four votes or something 58 to 62 or something like that um it did pass so then the resolution before us was whether we would close the primaries in 2026 and that also narrowly passed i think that vote was 
65.58 or something like that. It was that those numbers don't add up. I'm bad at math, but it was it was very close. I think it was by eight or nine votes that the 2026 resolution passed. So, in effect, the party voted to close the primaries as of 2026. Um, I certainly think 2026 is better than 2024, um, but I just still don't support the notion that closing our primaries is going to achieve the goal that half of the state executive committee thought that it will. What is that goal? um, I think the goal from their perspective is to um, ensure that we're electing true Republican candidates to then represent us in the general election. Um, I think a lot of people feel that with an open primary, you can have unaffiliated voters or Democrats even switch over to unaffiliated and then, I guess, sway your primary and and ultimately who your party chooses to represent you in the general. Um, I don't think I do think that happens. Um, we've got a great example with Doug Scaff running as a Republican for Secretary of State. He is in no way a Republican. Um, he was literally just six months ago the minority leader, um, and his most recent voting records show how liberal he is. Um, but closing the primary does not prevent people like Doug Scaff from simply changing their party affiliation and becoming a Republican and doing the exact same thing. Um, So I just don't believe that closing the primary achieves the goal that, you know, the half of the committee felt that it would. Summer, uh, locally, who all was involved in this vote out of the Eastern Panhandle that we might know? Um, Well, so I represent I'm one of the representatives from Berkeley County on, uh, that represents the 16th senatorial district. So basically, the state is split just like the uh, state senate is into districts. And then um, there are a male and female representative from every county that exists, I guess, is, or within that senate district. So like. The 16th Senate District has a male and female from Jefferson and a male and female from Berkeley. So uh, the 16th District is myself and Jason in Berkeley County, and then Gary Dungan and Jean Jacobs in Jefferson County. And then the 15th District, I know uh, Senate President Blair is one of them, and I think Pam Brush and... John Overington is on the committee, but I believe he was a, uh, appointed by the chairwoman as a member at large. Um, so I don't believe he was a he's a member like he's not representing the 15th district, but he is obviously from our area. And I struggle to remember who the others are from the 15th district, but that's okay. That's that's generally how how do, how do you go about getting on this committee to be able to vote on these things? Uh, we're we're on the the primary ballot, um, and then the voters vote on uh, who they want to, to represent them. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're elected by the primary voters, whether those are actual Republicans or people who oppose us Republicans, I'm not sure at this point. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's how it happens. So uh, what changed in one year? Because I think this was beaten back 80% to 20% a year ago. And now this year, the tone has changed so thoroughly that this would pass what changed any idea um i think a couple things have happened um one would be the doug scaff thing that really has people within the party very upset um and rightfully so i'm very upset about it (laughs) to the point that i was like can i run for secretary of state against him because i was i'm very upset about it um I think that's one of the things. I think um, there were also some current candidates who, for whatever reason, think that or thought that closing this primary would help them. Um, I don't believe that that's the case, just like I don't believe closing the primary would prevent Doug Scaff from being the nominee. 
Um, I think that I think the Secretary of State's race was a big one, and then the governor's race, and and there were some more locally ones um, that people started to think if we close this primary, we'll get we'll ultimately get the candidate that's more conservative, or um, we'll prevent someone like Doug Scaff from being our nominee for Secretary of State. I just don't believe that that's the case. I don't think this this decision had that much bearing on those ultimate outcomes. The article I read on the Metro News site uh, stated that uh, John Overington had made mention of the fact that it was a direct letter from Alex Mooney and Patrick Morrissey that really brought this issue to the forefront in terms of closing this in 24. They wanted to do it now and not in yeah. 26. Did you? Yeah, those, did, those are true? some of the candidates that were, I, I think, their campaigns felt that this would help them. <clears throat> did the delay till 26 happen in part because the clerks, some of the clerks objected to try to make this change in time for 24, or did that have nothing to do with it? <clears throat> I, I think I, uh, Senator Jack Woodrum uh, stood up and spoke during the meeting and gave a pretty good representation of how the clerks felt he read a letter from the uh, county clerks association that they were highly opposed to it because it would be extremely difficult we we're already over you know over a month into this current cycle um candidates have filed saturday night i believe was the deadline to file so you've already got candidates knee deep in their campaigns um i've worked on campaign republican campaigns for a decade or more i'm losing track at this point getting old um but i know firsthand how our candidates use the gop voter database and so i actually did talk during the meeting i was asked to to talk from that perspective of someone who's worked on those campaigns and used our gop dat- database um and so i just said you know changing this with like people have already started requesting absentee ballots. The, sec- the Secretary of State's office was asked in House Finance this past week, do you all have money in your in your budget to pay to inform every unaffiliated voter in this state of this change? Should it happen? And they said no. Um, and I know how much money the, par- the party has on hand, and the party doesn't have that kind of money either. Uh, so it would have it would have been chaos for our candidates trying to figure out how to target voters. It would have been chaos for the poll workers. Um, there were just a lot of reasons why doing it this cycle was a horrible idea, which is why I did join with those other two from the resolution committee to introduce the amendment um, to at least delay it for two years to where there could be some organization to it, an effort to notify people and have it not be mayhem on, on election day. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Summer. Uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, I commend you uh, that you were able to get it delayed to 26. I also agree with you the, the question of why it's needed at all. Uh, the only p- game in town during the primary are the is the Republican side. So all the unaffiliated, non-affiliated are going to shift to the uh, uh, to the Republicans. So you're going to booster your numbers to be sure. But I don't think you're going to change the mentality or the philosophy. No. I'm, I'm using myself as an example. I will probably yeah. shift them back to Republican, uh, but I'm going to still consider uh, vote the way that I've always felt, uh, right? M- as opposed to being the purity that that some folks th- think you're going to get out of it. Uh, I right. believe there's going to be the impression that the Republicans are being portrayed as elitist, and I don't think that's going to serve. Uh, I don't think it's going to make much difference either way, actually. Yeah, and you're exactly right. You, you are the perfect example of what I have been trying to explain to people. It is not difficult to change a party affiliation. And if you're currently an unaffiliated voter, uh, we in the GOP database can see that you are an unaffiliated voter. So if we want to target true Republicans with get out the vote efforts or whatever communications we want to send to them, right now we can. But if you know when this happens 
I'm assuming it will if no other changes are made. Um, when this happens, people like you will register as Republicans and then our candidates lose the ability to target um, with their with their message true Republican candidates that we want voting in our primaries. Um, and like you said, with the elitist comment, um, there was <clears throat> some uh, stats mentioned about when the parties opened and closed. Um, and I wanted to mention that because I think it's insane. Like the arguments for closing the primaries are in my mind, just insanity because when I look at the history of what's happened over the last 37, 38 years. So our Republican primaries have been open since 1986. And in that time, our party went from being a super minority to now a super majority. And we've passed the most conservative agendas uh, on some topics in the entire country. Um, and on the other hand, the Democrats just opened theirs in 2017, and during their time of having closed primaries, they went from completely controlling our state to now struggling to even find people to fill the ballot. Um, and people want to, to keep telling us that this is going to be a good thing for our party, but history, recent history just does not support that notion at all. Um, so as someone who has been a Republican all my life, I grew up in a Republican household. I became a Republican the day I registered to vote um, and has worked really, really hard for this party and for our candidates. It actually scares me what could come from this this move um, because I don't want to see us go back to wh where we were um, when we decided to open our primaries in 1986. So for me, it's it's kind of scary, and I don't think – I think people are thinking of, like, this election right now, and they think they have it all figured out as to what will happen if we make this move. But when you look at how this state has transformed over the last 35 years plus, um, it, it just doesn't support that idea at all. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> trying to wrap my head around this and, and trying to make it make sense to me. Um, by <laughs> <laughs> By closing up the primary, well, let's go another way. It seems to me that taking independence at their word, they're really independent. They, they're unsure. They're not, they're not comfortable with the extremes of either side. So you sit back and you try to influence, as an independent, one tries to influence the selections of their party, kind of lean to the right, but they're parts of the, the Republican uh, platform that, makes the voter uncomfortable. So he tries to influence it, and then when he sees who the candidate is, he makes his decision. It just seems to me that by, by making a true independent, forcing their hand and saying you have to be one or the other, I think there's, you know, actions have consequences. I, I think this is a way to push the true independence over to the other side, over, over to the, the Democrats. And then also... No, no. What independent do you know that's going to say, you know what, I've been an independent or unaffiliated voter for years. I think now I'm going to become a Democrat because they have so many options in their primary and they really ultimately have a say. <laughs> I mean... But but that that cycles through too. I mean, supermajorities do not last. In fact, I think supermajorities kind of ultimately form a circular suicide, a circular firing squad and and implode and implode. Oh, um, sure, sure. And and this effort to purify the Republican Party to make it as right wing as it can as it can be, which is what I interpret this effort to be. I don't know, it just seems to me that we're deliberately turning backs on, on those who are in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with the latter part. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think people are going I, yeah, to I shift to the Democratic the Party, though. <laughs> I think they're going to shift to the Republican. Yeah. Unless the Republican Party becomes untenable, unless it becomes so well, far uh, right. Well, uh, with all with this uh, surge of independence, which is approximately one third of the electorate, right. if they if the majority of them register Republican, which I firmly believe they will, that's not going to uh, uh, it's going to, if anything, uh, deter the Republican Party from moving too far to the right.
I think if anything is going to work against the argument of the folks like uh, uh, that that are advocating that they close the primary. Okay, and I guess history shows that the the middle of the road doesn't vote in primaries anyway. Actually, the middle of the road does Actually, vote. They do vote in yeah. primary. Do they? Yeah, but in this case, with open primary, uh, they shift to the party uh, that's where all the action is. And right now, all the action is on the Republican Everybody side. Everybody wants to be a winner? Well, yeah, they, so in they, 2020, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, they, they want to have a say-so yeah. on who's going to be the winner. Uh, right now, the Democrats are, do not really present much of an option. I go back to this. Yeah, oh, from, from a fundamental standpoint of what a party is. And a party's job is to get its members to nominate a candidate. And I still haven't heard a compelling argument for why someone who's not in the party should have a say in nominating that party's members. Well, I think that uh, <laughs> my compelling argument is that these are taxpayer-funded primaries. There are states that do not have their taxpayers fund their primaries if, if you if they if the parties close them. Um, and I one of the things I was going to say is I would not be surprised if some in the legislature attempt to make that move. Um, if you're going to tell a huge portion of the population that you have to fund these primaries, but you do not get to participate in them, then perhaps the legislature will feel that the parties should fund the primaries. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, our Republican Party in the state does not have that kind of money. Um, so I don't, I don't know what move they would make from that point. But Well, that, you, it, br it, you bring up a fair point, and, and yours is a money point, and it's a disenfranchisement point as well for those who aren't registered. But from the youngest days of my life taking a what would it be a civics course I guess you you learn that if you're not a member of a party you can't vote in the primary if you live in that kind of a state and at that time when I was a wee pup there weren't I don't think there were a lot of states with open primaries but that was the deal if you want to be an independent which a lot of people do prefer to be independent you you did that with the tacit understanding that the primary was not for you that was, that's how it works. We're using the term open primary, and in a sense it is, but it's really more semi-open. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, you, have, you have to stay on one ballot. Exactly. You can't, you can't uh, hop back and forth. Mississippi has a truly open primary, uh, whereas a Democrat can vote for a Republican. So does Virginia. The group. I'm sorry? So does Virginia. Yeah. I did not realize Virginia. Okay. And, and to me, that makes if, if that's the case, then let's not have parties and let's not have party primaries because the purpose of a party in a primary is to nominate your party's candidate so again i go i go back to that same thing i brought up as an example on friday if we were picking state championship contestants for football if we were picking the teams and everybody had their own vote and martinsburg wins it every year why why should we open it up to people in canal county to vote to to affect whether I, or not Martinsburg can go or not, right? Would, is everybody going to vote for Hedgesville or Musselman? Argument, Rob. Right. I mean, yeah. it's it's and I, and and I don't disagree with the points being made that it's been great for the Republican Party to allow independents to, to to have a vote because it's grown the party. The evidence is there, absolutely. And you combine that with the Obama and then Trump effects, it supercharged the party. It's like it gave it a giant shot of steroids, right? So, yeah, from, from a purpose of whether this is an intelligent move to make or not, I don't disagree with you that, it, that it's probably not the best thing to do. But from the pure party standpoint, fundamentally speaking, this is what a party's created to do, nominate its own candidates. Anyway, so I, I know you need to get going, Summer, so you get the final word here. I, I, I agree with your argument in theory, and that's what I, I – I certainly agree that if you're a Republican and you're part of our club – you elect the officers, so to speak. Um, but while, as long as they're taxpayer funded and not party funded, and just for the sheer fact of I'm a Republican and I'm trying to protect our party, I don't think that this move does that. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, like I don't disagree. The, the proponents think and say it will. Um, so that's kind of my, I guess, my last final. Yeah. I'm, I'm a middle child. I, I can see your points. That's what I do. It's wonderful how the first guest on this morning 
to agree that I can agree that I agree with totally. Thanks, yeah. Summer. It's great to have you on. <laughs> you know what, Bill? This might be the only time we agree. That's somewhere. exactly right. We don't agree no. often, but we do agree now. <laughs> That's not true at and, all. And congratulations on the uh, the new baby girl, coming. Mingo Mingo Barrett, Mingo. due in May. <laughs> yes. Let's put that on the ballot. Put that on the primary ballot. Yeah. Let it. Hey, let's let's name her baby. This is. We should incorporate this. Let other people's families vote for the name of your kid, and you have to abide by it. That's we do the open for primaries at that's charity open, events. That is the open primary system. Why don't you open that up for a charity event and let somebody name the baby? I think that would yeah. be great. Hospice would make you know, a lot of yeah. money on that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we, just call this child could. Mingo. Yeah, we could make a lot of money on that, but oh, we we really really love her name, so. <laughs> oh, okay. We're probably we're probably not going to go that way. <laughs> Summer, thank you very much. Thanks, Summer. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.